to the Rebel Love Show. We are a once a week broadcast from Manchester, New Hampshire, where we are pro pot, pro gun, and pro coffee. You can find all of our content on Voluntary Virtues. You can go find us on Facebook, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, and also LRN.FM. We are now syndicated on there, so go check out LRN because. They're amazing out there. I am Rob Mathias. And I'm Shire Dude. And today our guest is none other than the one and only Matthias von Gutenberg. He writes for Bitcoin Magazine and does speeches, and and he's a neighbor. So. He's the most exciting Vaughn in the Liberty Movement since Vince. <laughs> <laughs> that is very, very true. How how's your uh, your December been so far, Matthias? Oh, pretty good. Um, pretty different. Things have been... Things have been changing for me. Uh, certain things don't change, of course. The activism stays the same. The uh, passion stays the same. The speechifying, if anything, increases. Uh, but there's new work to be found, new avenues to pursue. I myself just got back from a family vacation in Florida, so that was nice. Yeah, yeah. I know we're both starting new work, which is awesome. But uh, we don't talk about our day jobs here, so yeah, that's a uh, that's part of the Clark. Yeah, that's part of the Clark Kent. Yeah, exactly. The like this is the, here. You're Superman. You know, out there, you're oh, Clark sure. Kent. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. Yeah, but I, I can I can relate. Um, but uh, anywho, uh, we're all doing stuff at Liberty Forum, right? It's right around the corner, isn't it? No, yeah. It's what, three months from now. I know that doesn't seem that far, but in all honesty, it's really more like two because beginning of March. So it's really like. Two and a half months, two now, months. Rob, are you speaking at Liberty Forum? Yeah, I'm doing. I am doing two. I guess two talks. I, it hasn't been really confirmed yet. I don't want to talk about which one it might be about. Um, but uh, we're we are doing uh, Rebel Love Show at Liberty Forum twice. I don't know the exact dates uh, or time that we're going to be recording. Probably the eighth and the tenth of March, because Liberty Forum is at uh, in Manchester, which is literally like two blocks from where we are right now. So we can just walk down there, but we're going to record there. So come up to Liberty Forum, hang out, and right. watch the show. And we'll, you're going to be filming and working. Yeah, Liberty I'm going to be Forum. filming a full episode of Shire Dude while I'm there. So if you come down to Liberty Forum, you can get in that, and we can have a lot of fun making that. And I'm also speaking. I'm 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 doing a talk for Alt Expo. I don't want to give away the what it, what it is yet. yet because oh, I didn't I even know you were doing a talk. I still got some writing to do. Yeah, it's a lot of in the plannings. So yeah, yeah. Matthias, yeah. you're, you're doing a talk at Liberty Forum, right? Yeah, yeah. I've got some exciting stuff coming up at Liberty Forum. W what's going on on, uh, on What's on your docket? So uh, nothing set in stone, I guess. But working with the organizers for a spot at the Govern Yourself panel. Oh, so I believe it's a section that is uh, either um, either Alt Expo in name or Alt Expo in spirit. I know that there was some kind of yeah, there's a little rift or some going kind of connection. on. Well, there was some, as I understand it, the um, Pork Fest organizers were so pleased with how much the Alt Expo had of turnout this past summer, um, and yet there's still not necessarily a large um, desire to incorporate them completely. The, the the Free State Project organizers, higher up, so to speak, are um, you know are in favor of some of the political stuff. Are in favor of some of the see the the, the things that Alt Expo you know tries to find alternatives to. Uh, but they are impressed with the turnout and this and the spirit and the passion of those people. So they they are going to be hosting a Govern Yourself section, which will be Alt Expo like. If not, if not in name itself, but I'm working with those organizers to deliver um, a short 20, 30 minute talk on uh, Bitcoin and crypto anarchy and the future of liberty. Um, and it'll be similar to a talk I gave half a year ago at Porkfest. Yes, which your, was your Porkfest one was amazing. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what condition Shire Dude was in when he listened to <laughs> it, but I remember seeing you in oh, the audience. Oh, man, yeah. He, he's still there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was completely ad-libbed. It's completely extemporaneous. Um, just throughout my life, I don't, I, don't, I don't take notes. I don't bring prepared remarks. I don't read from index cards. If I don't know the subject matter well enough to speak on it, then I try not to speak on it. Um, so I'll be following in the same vein um, at Liberty Forum. But in addition, uh, Jack Shimmick and I are um, planning or in the works or discussing a um, 
a project where I, I believe we're going to distribute literature that, um, how should I say, at the minimum, discourages people from participating in the political process. I'll put it that way. Okay. So I'm interested in collaborating with uh, Jack. He's got a very large history of kind of being kind of a, um, a, a, a serious activist, but also kind of a wild card. And it'll be interesting <laughs> to join forces and see what the two of us can accomplish. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Is this going to be at Liberty Forum or just in general? No, at, at Liberty Forum. At Liberty a Forum. Targeted, targeted chunk of, of libertarian activists, different types of anarchists. And, and for those that aren't aware, Liberty Forum is more of the hotel conference kind of counterpart to the um, wild, buck-naked, bohemian version of this pork fest. Very true. <laughs> uh, so it's a little bit more... Um, stuffy. It's a little bit more suit and tie. It's a little bit more status quo defending, but it's fun. It's exciting. There's a lot of talk about really radical stuff like Bitcoin, like secession. Um, there are some really riveting speakers that that'll be coming. I haven't checked the, I haven't checked the um. A lot still the in the list planning. Yet, like a lot of people that have signed up for wanting to talk or whatnot or have been asked to talk. I mean, a lot of those, like uh, like for me, I haven't really finalized what I'm even talking about mm -hmm. yet. Um, I know I'm going to be. I'm actually doing a meeting next week, like kind of discussing what's going on. But um, I'm excited about Liberty Forum. Besides, first off, come up to Liberty Forum. Don't even, even if you don't even see anything, even if you don't see a single one of our talks or anything like that, just come up and hang out in the hotel lobby and hang out with a bunch of other libertarians. Yeah, uh, definitely get your tickets at nhlibertyforum.com. Yeah, they're currently $99. It's going up to 125 until, By the time you hear this episode, it's 125 <laughs> But you can pay yeah. in Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah, so go buy go buy a ticket with Bitcoin from uh, for Liberty Forum. And come up in March and come check out uh, Manch Vegas, which is great. I love living here. Anyways, so what's going on? Matthias, what's going on with Bitcoin? Give us a, a status update on Bitcoin. You're you're the the show's Bitcoin expertise here. Man, that's quite an honor. <laughs> um, so let's see some of the most exciting things recently. Um, just as far as merchant adoption is concerned, uh, the biggest news has to be Microsoft taking Bitcoin. Uh, so they are um, completely in as far as Bitcoin for digital goods. So you can purchase Xbox Live games. You can purchase time on Xbox Live. You can purchase apps from the Windows phone app, like the App Store. Um, you can buy all types of digital goods with Bitcoin through Microsoft. And Bill Gates, uh, I don't know how much power he has still over the actual executive decision-making at Microsoft, but Bill Gates has come out and has described how Bitcoin is more than currency and how Microsoft has very large global visions for Bitcoin. So that'll be very interesting. Um, besides that, the price has more or less kind of settled. We're looking at kind of between 300 and 330, 340, something like that. Um, this happened last year. This happened in, in the cycles before, where there's just kind of kind of flat lines and plateaus at a a price that everyone thinks is is undervalued, and it kind of gets um, it kind of gets sat on for a bit before before it usually breaks out again. Um, not that I not that I promise or speculate. I, I don't engage in price speculation. Yeah. Um, I'll leave that to the people who throw darts against the wall, um, and <laughs> they can they can pick what they think the price should or will be. Uh, but very exciting things happening. Two new ama two new amazing uh, people running for the members uh, running for the board of the Bitcoin Foundation. Cody Wilson is running to be, I believe, e either president or chairman or on the board of the Bitcoin Foundation, explicitly with the purpose to dismiss the Bitcoin Foundation. Yeah, I, I was going to say a lot of people are, are for just getting rid of it because I know, um, God, wh wh who, and his name's drawing a, uh, a blank, Adrianopoulos, um Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, yes, he didn't. He he, he stated that he wa he left the board, didn't he? And yeah. he wants to uh, remove the board all com all completely. I'm not sure what his ideas are for getting rid of it, but I know that he left. Um, he 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 left his presence from the Bitcoin Foundation due to uh, just how how non professional and how kind of childish and how um, how well, what kind of a bad image that they had. And uh, there were all just all, all types of scandals um, with Mount Gox and with, what was his name, Brock Pierce, who has various crimes in Europe alleged against him. And it's just a very kind of strange situation. But 
Um, cool people are running for it. So Bruce Fenton, who is an FSP signer um, and an early Bitcoin adopter, very intelligent. He's running uh, for the Bitcoin Foundation, uh, presumably to kind of save it and reform it from the inside. We'll see how successful that is. Um, I usually find that, I mean, my opinion is that building new new institutions is usually more valuable than trying to reshape old broken ones. Uh, but I'm, as I understand, he wants to turn the Bitcoin Foundation into something like the Linux Foundation, which is supposed to be non-biased and just kind of promoting the advancement of Linux just in general and doesn't take sides and doesn't have politics and things like that. Uh, so it, it'll be interesting if he can affect that. Um, Linux is a very popular, uh, though I, I will say very innocuous, um, open source operating system, whereas Bitcoin is poised to basically topple the entire worldwide fractional reserve banking system, which to me carries a little bit more of a, um, a heavy tone to it and seemingly has a lot more riding on <laughs> its success. Uh, but, uh, you know, of course, I, I like and I support both. So we'll see where it goes. Um, there was the Bitcoin Bowl in St. Petersburg, Florida, actually. So uh, NC State and UCF squared off in the Bitcoin Bowl that was sponsored by BitPay. And they were actually the first Bitcoin commercials ever aired on TV were by BitPay. And they weren't horrible. They were, they were, um, they were okay. I'll have to go Google that because uh, the commercials. I'm kind of curious what the, a Bitcoin commercial looks like on like cable TV. It was pretty. I mean, there was one that was pretty funny. Um, this, you know, this woman was, you know, there was a, a a merchant who was selling and you know buying goods with with customers, and every time someone bought something, so there's a scene where they're buying ice cream from the merchant, and um, or it's or it's some kind of dessert or cake or something, and this guy comes up and like sticks his finger in it and takes like a like a, a chunk out of what they're eating and he eats it and my name is Bit Boris you pay me credit card fees blah 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 and she's like yeah I don't do that anymore goodbye <laughs> so it it was kind of like a that's pretty cool it was kind of funny yeah um it reminded me of the scene in uh, I believe it was Parks and Rec where Ron Swanson takes a little girl out for ice cream and she is about to get into it, and he says, uh uh, uh before you eat it. And, and he kind of grabs it and takes, like, a huge bite out of it. And he says, here you go. Now you understand taxes. <laughs> and she's like, what? But that was mine. I don't understand. It's kind of a similar kind of a similar, uh, yeah, similar yeah. scene. Uh, nice. Awesome. All right. So when it – I want Bitcoin just to be – I want I – want, when, when are we going to hit the promised land where everything's a Bitcoin? Like, that's – Oh, I'm man. tired of hearing about the Federal Reserve. What's I'm, the, yeah, what's the timeline here? When when are we going to see this huge step of mass adoption? It's not going to. I, I see. I don't think that it'll be. Um, I don't think that it'll be a, a mass adoption like, like the biblical God flooding the earth and all of a sudden everything was covered in, in water and Bitcoin. <laughs> um, I, I think that you know over time as it becomes more popular, as it becomes safer, as larger and larger companies, more reputable people start endorsing it. Um, there are people now that still are very much against Bitcoin, like Warren Buffett has frequently described Bitcoin uh, as rat poison, uh, as basically anathema, uh, that he sh nobody should touch it, that it's, it's some kind of crazy, ludicrous, speculative gamble. Um, so there are there are some strong holdouts, but there are also some very interesting characters that have come around that used to that used to despise Bitcoin or not understand it, and who now, um, after being very vocal with their uh, shall I say ignorant comments, have looked into it a little bit further and and now find themselves um, standing corrected and and publicly saying so. So it's interesting. The tide's turning. What'll happen to achieve what you're talking about economically? What needs to happen? is that more and more people need to start um, retaining Bitcoin as their unit of account. Uh, so currently a lot of the merchants, do will, they will accept Bitcoin, but even even Overstock, um, even Patrick Byrne, the, the Bitcoin evangelist, the messiah that wants to destroy Wall Street with, with Bitcoin and counterparty to make a new kind of crypto equity platform, believe they only retain 10% of the Bitcoin holdings that they receive. 
So that's a small fraction. They convert everything else to fiat, and that's great. And they've got plans to pay their suppliers in Bitcoin and to give employee bonuses in Bitcoin, you know, you know, more than they otherwise would have, things like that, you know, little incentives. Uh, but people, people need to start retaining the units themselves and treating the units themselves as individually valuable. So there's a great article uh, by Daniel Crowitz. He says that um, Bitcoin is actually the best unit of account. Um, and he says that he's, he's, he's kind of contrasting different views about Bitcoin. So if you believe that Bitcoin will overtake the world fiat system and it will overtake the world's financial system, then you don't really care right now in the short run how much a Bitcoin is worth because you're just holding until that day. Um, so what you care about is not how many dollars worth of Bitcoin you have, but how many units, how many Satoshis, how many bits you have, right? Um, so there's kind of the long-running Bitcoin joke of Laszlo who bought you know, the first transaction in Bitcoin. He bought two large pizzas. It was like $28 or whatever, and he spent 10,000 Bitcoin. And that's multi-millions at this point. Um, and so it's, it's kind of interesting that, you know, that the dude was rich and he didn't even know it. Um, but he, he didn't see it in, uh, and, and, and either he didn't see it or, or he didn't care or he wanted his friends to be in it or something like that. But when people start seeing the, start seeing their finances, they start seeing the world, um, kind of in a Bitcoin lens, then they'll start, um, they'll start hoarding every single Satoshi that they can possibly hold on to. It'll be like smog from The Hobbit, just like <laughs> lording it over this gigantic mound of treasure, right, that just destroys and eat passers-by that want to steal it from him. But currently, most people, and if, and if they're not into Bitcoin, if they just think Bitcoin's cool or some kind of idle fantasy, they'll continually regard it in terms of the fiat it, that it can be exchanged for. And so they will... Uh, so it's it's funny. So they will see the fluctuations of Bitcoin, and they'll see how volatile it is, and they say, "Ah, oh, well, this can't possibly work. Why would anyone take this seriously?" Um, you know. Th so those, as Daniel says, those still lost in the dollar world see the wild and extreme fluctuations of Bitcoin as an impediment. But if you're looking from the Bitcoin world into the dollar world, what you see is the opposite. What you see is the longest and most devastating economic crash in history, <laughs> because Bitcoin can buy more dollars year over year over year uh, since it began. And so there's a funny kind of graphic. I guess you can Google it if you want. That shows the um, it shows the S and P 500 calculated in terms of Bitcoin, and it just is this. It just it's just crashing, right? 2011, 2012, yeah. 2013, 2014. It's logarithmic. So it's like by factors of 10, it's just crashing year over year over year. And it's, it's kind of funny. Um, so, you know, I, I think that when people start to change this perspective and they start to stand more in the Bitcoin space than they stand in the dollar space and they kind of look through the porthole in the opposite direction, they'll start seeing the little bits they own, the little, you know, the little mini bits here. I've got half a Bitcoin. I've got whatever these things as potential untold fortunes and they'll be extremely reluctant to part with them so i don't like parting with bitcoin anymore um even in uh the super secret underground anarchist hideout uh i don't like to give up bitcoin for beer anymore uh -huh. because that's you know it's like six millibits well as long as you just replenish the bitcoin that you're spending with you know then just buy more bitcoin sure you, you well, know you, you can but that involves finding somebody else who also values it at that you know so that involves finding someone who's in the dollar world that doesn't really care much about giving up those bitcoins for those price yeah you know i don't believe that a bitcoin is worth 330 dollars or whatever well, see, that's just the price that the exchanges are currently broadcasting. I think I think it's a Bitcoin is worth fantastic multiples much more than that. I don't really have a problem uh, trying to find a uh, well. I consider themselves. I consider someone who would get I get Bitcoin from a buyer because they're buying my Federal Reserve notes. Right. You know, I'm not. I don't. I'm not buying Bitcoin. I'm getting rid of my paper. <laughs> um, but uh, every time I haven't had a trouble finding something that's going to sell to me on spot or close to spot. Whenever I actually do use Bitcoin, 
Uh, and I like to use it uh, basically against what you just said. Uh, I like to use it in person as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Um, but whenever I do, I always try to replenish my Bitcoin. Well, keep in mind as well that we're still in a price discovery phase for Bitcoin. So I, I don't actually think Bitcoin will ever level out so to speak, people ask me, like, well, what's Bitcoin ultimately worth? A hundred thousand, a million dollars a coin? And they imagine some kind of parity emerging between fiat and Bitcoin where it's like a, a slightly higher price for Bitcoin and people will sell for fiat or a slightly higher price for fiat and people will sell for Bitcoin until some kind of equilibrium is reached. But that totally misunderstands the transform, the transformative value of Bitcoin. It's either all or nothing. Yeah. It's either going to be reckoned in the millions per coin or it's going to be worth zero. Um, and that's because they are exclusionary they are exclusionary items. They are media of exchange that are competing with each other. And it's in the nature of media of exchange to beat out competitors and for one to emerge as a universal medium of exchange, as, as a money, right? Yeah, you don't you don't hold on to Bitcoin so you can sell it off for Federal Reserve notes way down the road unless you really need to for the money. You hold on to Bitcoin until you can just spend Bitcoin. It's it's funny. It reminds me. There's a little um, there's a little graphic that I used for one of the articles I wrote for Bitcoin Magazine, um, and I was writing I was writing the article hoping to address um, the Austrian economists who. Um, some of the younger crowd may be more interested or, or, or who can kind of countenance the ideas. Much of the older Austrian crowd simply don't fathom or can't understand why this fascination, fascination with Bitcoin exists. But there's a graphic that I used that borrows from the Matrix. And it's the scene where, you know, Neo is asking Morpheus and it's like it's like memed. So there's like different letters on it. But he's asking Morpheus, so what are you saying to me that someday my Bitcoin will be worth millions and Morpheus responds to him and says, no, Neo, what I'm trying to tell you is that when you're ready, um, you won't have to, you know, trade them out or whatever that, you know, I probably messed it up, but that they'll be money themselves. They yeah. won't just be worth a lot of money, but they'll actually be the repository, you know, the unit of account that people do all their calculation in. So I think that's the end game. How much, how much fiat that's going to be able to purchase in 20 years could be, could be infinite. It could be, you know, somebody, you, you could ask somebody in the 1930s, oh, well, how, how many notes from the Weimar Republic are these things going to be worth in 20 years? And that exploded into hyperinflation and it got, you know, taken over by the Third Reich and various other types of European money systems. So now you can't really find Weimar notes. If you could, they'd be worthless. Uh, so a Bitcoin would be, could be just worth an infinite number of them, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so the idea is kind of the same, that... As Bitcoin grows and takes over and to become dominant, it's not going to leave some small little enclave for U.S. dollars to keep circulating and functioning and retaining their own little economy. And it's it's going to it's like it'll be a contagion. It it spreads virally, and it spreads from one person to the next to the next like an epidemic. Uh, because everybody sees their neighbors using it, or they'll read in the news, or they'll see it down the street, or their merchant, their little old shops accept it, or their family members talk about it, or the the price goes crazy, stock markets are having a hard time figuring it out or whatever, and it's going to infect every kind of aspect or facet of people's life. Um, so this idea of what a Bitcoin will be worth in the longest of terms, uh, I think just really misses the whole point of Bitcoin. Uh, that it's it's not going to allow for that kind of calculation to take place because the dollars won't be won't be won't the, the, the nobody, dollar will be irrelevant. Nobody we'll be, will ex- we'll be comparing Bitcoin to Bitcoin. R- yeah, bit or Bitcoin yeah. to gold or yeah. Bitcoin to palladium or Bitcoin to other types of amazing digital uh, digital resources. You know, at some point, um, merchants will not accept your worthless fiat paper. They will not accept your worthless bank. You know, promises from these insolvent central banks for real goods and services. They will demand something valuable, and that something will probably be Bitcoin, or it will be some other kind of super currency that emerges afterwards. Do you think a, a super uh, currency is going to emerge soon after Bitcoin, like now, this year, or whatnot with Bitcoin? It, I mean, there's a lot of alt currencies might, out there. It might already exist, but... It might it, be Dogecoin. It might... <laughs> it, it could come back. It <laughs> might be Dogecoin, it might be NXT, it might be ether you know the ethereum program or whatever it could be i guess it could be any of those but we won't we won't see that revealed for a long time because bitcoin is such a commanding head start 
over everything else. It's by far um, the Goliath. Oh, know, absolutely. Of, the, you know, in, in, of all of the cryptocurrencies, it commands like 97% of the whole crypto market cap is just pure Bitcoin. Uh, it's by far the most liquid. It's by far the most secure blockchain, the most secure network. Uh, it's by far the most accepted everywhere in the world than any other crypto coin. So it's kind of like, and I made this reference in one of my articles, it's kind of like um, there's old stories of like old heroes, like like Greek myths, you know, like you have like heroes um, like Odysseus or, or Achilles or whatever. And you realize at some point they must have been children. They must have been infants, right? So when they were infants, when they were children, they existed. They were real and factual, and you could point to them, but they were ineffective to change anything in the world. They had to mature. There had to become time. They had to grow into adolescence and adulthood. If you've ever played the game Fable, uh, it's kind of like that. Uh, Fable, I think, is a, is a great game. It's kind of a yeah, cho- choose Mora- your own morality. Any game that has morality in it is amazing. Yeah, but like you start as a child, and you you know your choices as a child can determine who you'll be and whatever, but you can't really do shit as a child. All you can do is just beat up local bullies and give toys to other kids and, and do whatever, but you become an adolescent, and then you become like a, you know an adult with magic powers, and you can actually change the shape of the world. So it's a similar thing with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Right now, Bitcoin is the adolescent who's kind of... Um, or rather, maybe the preteen. It's just kind of gr- getting growing pains and stretching their legs and whatever. Every other altcoin is still just an infant in diapers at this point. Yeah, I can see that. Um, I just want to get to the point where Bitcoin is just used everywhere. Like that's. I mean, that's what I want. I want to see that happen. I want to see that happen in my lifetime. I kind of get to that point here in this community. Yeah. But uh, I'm tired of using their money. So, but you know, honestly, I don't see the. I mean, the Fed is backed by the gun. So, I mean, I don't see the you know paper money going away anytime too soon, unfortunately. But like you said, it's going to be a snowball effect where it's gonna it's not going to happen overnight, but it's just going to keep rolling where more and more people know about it. And it's not just Bitcoin in isolation. It's not like um, this is America in 1790 and everything is like pristine and brand new and the wrapping just came off the government and everyone is just enamored in this honeymoon phase and all of a sudden Bitcoin comes along and it's like, well, maybe this will take off and snowball effect. There's effects upon effects upon effects. So the police are absolutely out of control. The government spending is absolutely out of control. Taxes and regulations are absolutely out of control. And all of these things compound with each other. So people people don't want to pay taxes. They don't want to send their money to go to buy bear cats for police departments that have, you know, reside in towns of 12,000 people. Well, like in, um, what was it, like New London or, or somewhere up here in New Hampshire, they're getting another one of those. Jesus Christ. Yeah. People don't, people resent their children being taken from them forcibly because of the way they're raising them. People resent being shot in the street for dancing or for selling Lucy's, for selling untaxed cigarettes. People are resenting more and more and more facets of the American government and enforcement apparatus. More and more people are, are rejecting the TSA as just totally asinine, totally unnecessary, totally stupid. I, I experienced the TSA twice, um, going to Florida and then coming back from Florida over holiday. And each time was kind of a funny episode. Um, so the first time that I left, I, I left New Hampshire. So the TSA in New Hampshire are actually more humane, and they're they're more patient, and they're kind of regular people just because the airport in Manchester yeah. is just teeny, teeny well, tiny. Well, M- Manchester is so small that like when I when I left for California back in September, one of the TSA agents was uh, someone who recognized me from my day job. Really? Yeah. So like he came up to me and I uh, was like. Hey Rob, how's it going? I'm like, <laughs> this is like at three in the morning. I'm like dead tired because I got an early, early flight. I'm like, I I recognized him after like t- five seconds looking at him. I'm like, oh yeah, you're like a customer and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, it's scary because like this TSA agent looked right at me, knew who I was, and came up to me. I'm like, how do you know who I am? Like, why do you know me? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, but uh, yeah, Manchester, like it was weird. Like I. 
you know, got recognized by the TSA, which was a little unsettling. Well, that's better than them perhaps recognizing you from the show. Yes, absolutely. It was from my day job, not the show. Yes, so that's that's <laughs> right. a whole different thing. You know, you know, but uh, go go ahead with your TSA because I got a little add on to what I do with the TSA. Well, it's so it's funny. I I didn't actually used to think that trolling served any valuable social function whatsoever. I just thought it was purely like an act of psychological aggression that um, that that angry angry teenagers and Chris Cantwell would take out on people, and then I kind of started to realize that there are two, there, or there are two, or perhaps more than two valid targets for trolls, and I think those are government employees, um, specifically those that are particularly onerous and invasive. So I love to troll the shit out of some TSA agents. I think it's Who does I think it's so funny and I can and I think it's the funnier it is the more awkward they make it. So every time I get my I get my enhanced massage go through TSA um very infrequently only if I'm running very late for a flight will I enter into the the rapist scan and assume the surrender position um but er, almost 99 out of 100 times I will opt for the enhanced the enhanced pat down. Uh, just because those gloves feel so good on my on my flesh, <laughs> my, on my uh, shirt, right down your pants. Yeah, right down the waistband. But uh, so I got a pat down this, you know, com- leaving New Hampshire, and it was a newbie. He was in training. He, you know, he was being supervised by an older dude who had, you know, run the ropes, and I know how to do this, and I'm going to show you, blah blah blah. And so he's going through, and my favorite, you know, they always give you the. Um, they they always give you like the equivalent of like the FBI warning when you watch movies. They always give you this like I'll be putting two hands on your blah 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 and I'll be blah 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 on all your sensitive areas and I'll be putting your two fingers in your waistband two inches and, all, and they give you the whole disclaimer right. And they always ask you know are there any sensitive areas I should know about? And every single time I try the hardest I can not to crack up, but I look them <laughs> as close in the eye as I can and I tell them just my dick and balls. <laughs> <laughs> Or some variant of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I hope that they go home at night and they reflect on the fact that their job actually, you know, there are people that they have to work with that are justified in telling them, don't manhandle my, my balls, right? Don't, don't manhandle my genitalia. And every time they kind of like, they kind of register it. Oh, okay, yeah, all right. And they kind of start to do their job. <laughs> and at this point, I'm, you know... He's down, you know, getting by my waist and my legs and patting my, my ankle socks and stuff down. And I'm and looking at the other guy, and he's just kind of watching and just kind of chilling out. And I started talking to him, you know, oh, how do you like this? Oh, how new is he? Uh, have you been watching over this for a while? What do you what do you make of all of this type of stuff? And I started addressing the guy patting me down as well. Do you like what you do? Is this something you'd ever thought you'd be doing? What are your impressions about this? I didn't get answers for most of these questions. Um, they were friendly. Like, they didn't. You know, they weren't aggressive or hostile to me, uh, but they also weren't in the mood for answering questions about how they like specifically avoiding uh, overhandling people's genitalia. Uh, so that was fun for me. I bid them a fair, you know, fond farewell after the massage, and I got on my plane. On the ride back, I took a flight from Tampa International. Uh, I connected in Atlanta and then connected to Manchester, and. Uh, almost without fail, every single time I go through TSA, there's at least one person that loudly and publicly complains about how unsafe and how ridiculous all of these measures are. And it's just somebody in line. It's just some person. It's not like it's not like the videos of that crazy naked wacko banging his drum in the department store saying, love each other, love each other. That's it's, Matthew it's, Silver. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he is great. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Don't buy things. Love each other. But it's not that. It's just like a it's normal like a person. It's like a regular fucking dude. It's a regular fucking person. And going through, going through Tampa, um, going through the security in there, uh, so I was putting all of my shit in these in these containers, in these, like, translucent containers, right? Basically getting undressed. People were walking ahead of me, kind of cutting me in, in the security line because I had to take off my belt, my shoes, my jacket, take off things out of my pocket, take off my backpack, the laptop, basically just disassemble whatever I was carrying so I could walk through there. And um, the way that they had it set up where there were those, those kind of um, dividers that had, like, the... Um, I guess they're like elastic or there's some kind of um, nylon things you clip into the metal posts, right, that form like... Stanchions, I believe they're called. Stanchions? I believe that's what it's called. Okay. 
Um, and there was like a, a dirty, a dirty kind of rubber mat under them. And on the tables where you had to move the, the uh, containers to push onto the conveyor belt, one of the metal tables was at an awkward angle and it was kicking up the mat and it was kind of ruining the stanchion and it was just kind of an, kind of an ugly scene. And there was a supervisor that came by and he must have thought that he was some kind of French gendarme in the First World War because he was just marching up and down, like, peering violently at various little details on the floor and at people and just, like, submitting his gaze upon everything very, like, intensely and, you know, kind of talking down and shouting to his uh, subordinates and giving directions to all of the plebeians around him who just want to go home, right? And he sees that this table is kind of off to the side and doesn't really fit perfectly with the rest of them. So he stops everyone. He stops. He gets right in the front of the way of everyone trying to move and get through security. And he lifts the table up on its side, turns it over, thus blocking the entire walkway, big obstruction, trying to fiddle and fix one of the feet and, and use his own feet to kick the mat up and try to, like, c clean it and, and move it so it wasn't, uh, you know, and other people were helping and picking the mat up and moving it and moving the stanchions or whatever. And this woman in front of me couldn't have been more than, could have been 40, 44 maybe, something like that. Could have, you know, probably a mother. She was the, she was the, she was the one. She was, this time she was just loudly asking, is this safe? What are you guys doing? Should you really be doing this now? Is this the best time for that? What are you doing? And, and they left like a huge gaping hole in security because they had to move the stanchions to make room for this thing. So it just seemed like it seemed like a fucking Dilbert comic strip, just like a big like <laughs> farce of like security theater where you get to look behind the scenes and nobody takes it seriously. And everyone else that I'm looking at, like I look behind me, like what's the reaction of other people during this? And everyone else is kind of like sheepishly grinning and, and kind of and kind of shrugging their shoulders and kind of be like, this is ridiculous. I can't believe it. I'm gonna be late. Like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Is he really need to do this now? And he he had no remorse. He had no like embarrassment. This is this is my job. Very you know, eins zwei. Very I have to do it this way. And I regret honestly that I don't know German well enough, uh, or I'd be able to impersonate these people much better. Uh, but it was just, it was absurd, and at that time, I chose not to say very much, uh, because I was stoned as fuck going through that, <laughs> um... You don't want to blow your cover. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, I'm yeah. playing. I'm playing the game at that point. Yeah, and I don't want to. I don't want to let anybody off to the fact that I uh, ended up inhaling the, you know, the the uh, combustible leftovers of harmless plant matter at that point, and, <laughs> and so the only thing I can think of that's apropos during that is, uh, I during that time, you know. This lady is like looking back at me, trying to get you know my sympathy, and she's like, "This isn't safe, right? Right? Is this is it just me, right?" And all I can think of are is just like the the murals before the TSA of all the American flags and God bless our heroes and the fallen soldiers and all of these like placards and propaganda with like pictures of people in the National Guard, like this guy's getting his MBA and like all the stupid carrying a child and all the stupid bullshit trying to like I I create patriotism and nobody's buying it. But I remembered one of the pieces of propaganda before was just this picture of the TSA emblem, the transportation, you know, the uh, transportation security, security, agency. security yeah, administration yeah. agency, right? Something like that. And at the bottom it said, uh, your safety is our priority. And I just, you know, I just thought that this is too fucking Orwellian. Just like the, the the expression itself, like Department of Homeland Security, no both all this shit is fucking Orwellian. Yeah. And so I just, rem I just, I just remarked to her, and she, you know, this lady's like, kind of having a laugh, and she's looking back at me, and I, you know, I kind of said, "Our safety is their priority," like in an obviously like sarcastic <laughs> way, and like the people around me start kind of cracking up and laughing, and nobody's taking this seriously, and it is just security theater. Um, Many times at the TSA tests itself, they fail. They're able to pass through yeah. weapons and well, it contraband. Has, it has and nothing to do with security. Things. It has everything to do with domestication. Absolutely, it's yeah. about it's about um, creating number one a culture of fear by holding up this pretense, and by two conditioning people to accept their servitude and their surrender, and to make people not fuss with. Assuming, assuming the position and having men put their hands down their pants yeah. and whatever, whatever is necessary for the name of national security citizen, y you must understand. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, for me, like I, I always use every time I go through the TSA, which is not often. I usually only fly once a year. 
uh, I use every opportunity that I have when I go through TSA to like, that's my moment of activism. Like I will purposely opt out. (laughs) I always opt out because I want, I want that like minute, minute and a half in front of another human being who's a TSA agent. I get this person. They're yours. They're mine. They get the, they get to uh, molest me in front of a crowd of people and I get to stare them dead in the eye. Yeah. All right. And every time this happens, you know, I've had different reactions, but the, the biggest one was actually here in Manch. Um, this TSA agent, who was not the guy that recognized me, different TSA agent. Um, as soon as he like goes through everything, you know, I, I do the same thing. I tell him, well, you know, don't touch, don't touch my cocker balls, or like, you know, that's do not touch that area. Like, don't, don't touch me right. there. You know, um, and uh, well, when he starts going, I, I instantly go to like, do you, do you enjoy molesting random men at the airport? Is that what you signed up for? <laughs> Did you do? You, how do you sleep at night knowing this is what you do for a living? Is this what was advertised on the pizza box when you <laughs> called the number to get this job? <laughs> yeah, you know, and then like, and then he like starts, he literally like blows up at me. All right. Uh, it's like, you know, how much, how do you expect me to do this if you keep going? As, I mean, do you want me to get a supervisor? Like, I want to get on my plane and get the hell out of this airport. Yeah. And uh, I don't think you really want, you're already violating my Fourth Amendment right. Now, mind you, I'm putting my minarchist cap on in front of these people, <laughs> you know, because I think the Constitution is nothing more than a goddamn piece of paper. But that being said, these people took a, an oath to, to protect and utter, defend it. You're going to utter the magic words to them. Yes. Against the, they, they took an oath to this document, and the Bill of Rights are part of that document. And, uh, you know, they took an oath to uphold and defend it against enemies foreign and domestic. Well, they're that domestic enemy when they're violating not just the Fourth. And he's like, you know, he wanted me to shut up. I'm like, are you really going to violate not just my Fourth Amendment right, but my First Amendment right? You're, you're telling me you're going to you know, molest me in person in front of me? You're going you're gonna to molest me right here in front of a bunch of people and prevent me from talking about it? Oh, he he had to walk away. He like came nose to nose, walked away, came back. He just like patted me down really quickly and off I was. Yeah. 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 Well, it's funny. The newbie that got me at New Hampshire this first time, um, after he asked me where he where I wouldn't like him to touch me, he asked me if I wanted if I preferred a private screening. I said, Hell no I don't. Oh yeah, yeah, they always ask you for a private <laughs> Hell screening. No, I don't. I want everyone to see this. Oh yeah, you wanna you you wanna do it in, in front of the entire crowd in, in front of everyone because you would you do that, you're showing the TSA for what they really are. Yep. You know, and it's I mean, yeah, I'm getting molested by some random man in the airport, which I don't really want to think about it that way, but it's pretty true. But at least that way, I'm hopefully I wake that person up to make try and convince them to quit their job. Yeah, but the same w- you want them to hate what they're doing. Yeah, I mean sometimes you have to have tough love. Like, look, I love all humanity, but when you're violating my space, my you know my liberty, my freedom, and like you know I'm supposed to be secure my person's papers and effects. Like this is not security. This mm-hmm. is oppression. This is tyranny. And if that person stepping over that line, I want to do whatever I can to convince that person to not do that. And if that means tough love, that means being an asshole to this person. Like, I'm not doing it because I hate this person. I'm, I'm trying to do it to push them in the right direction. Yeah. Right. Like, a large part of it is pulling them into the reality of the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, d- I did slightly, like, less than that last time I flew. Um, the guy was patting me down, and I was talking to him just kind of like a, like, just like a bro. Like, hey, man, like... This is kind of a weird job you have, like touching people, right? Like, you must <laughs> keep get, like, it real. You must get like free airline miles or something for this, right? And he's like, "No, I don't get anything like that." And I was like, "Man, that sucks." Then you should get a better job, you know? Like, and yeah, I was right. just trying to get on his level, you know? Yeah, right. Trying to touch try, my junk, trying and, to empathize. <laughs> yeah, because he must be. I mean, honestly, I think the people that ha- work those jobs are either themselves sadists or control hungry freaks, or they are in rough stations in life. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's people that, you know, go into TSA that they're doing it because they think they're doing something good. And on top of that, they just need a job. Yeah. And they're not really discriminatory about who they hire at the TSA. Or the people themselves aren't discriminatory about who they work for. Yeah, that too. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I remember <laughs> I ran into that the one guy that recognized me at the, uh, at the TSA. Uh, I ran into him at my job like a couple of weeks later. And... Uh, I remember telling him like, yeah, uh, no offense, but like he, we started talking about like him running into me there, and he's like he, I was, he told me how like I look flustered. I'm like, yeah, I really don't like the TSA. I don't like what they stand for. I don't like what they do. 
and uh, I know it's your job, but that's not an excuse. And I hope you really reconsider your, you know, involvement your, with, your those involvement people. with these people that are doing this to me. Right. You know, he he shook his head like, yeah, I, I just need a paycheck. I'm like, I understand that, but you're violating people's rights working there. I had this conversation with at my wow. normally I never have these conversations at m- my work. But he already saw me there, so it was like it, it wasn't in front of other people. But like, did you sell him anything after that, or? Nah, yeah, I did actually. He came <laughs> in and bought something. Um, but uh, I was nice to the guy because yeah. he was nice to me. And I'm at at the same time when I'm at my you know my day job. My uh, I want to go back into the matrix. I don't really talk about all this you know liberty and my life and stuff like that because I literally go to there because that pays for my existence here. So I, I try. Yeah, I don't do too much going in there. Well, that job I quit, so I don't really care about that job anymore. I'm not even working there anymore. Right, right. Um, but uh, I don't always, I don't bring too much of my philosophy into my job as, until like I really befriend people there. Mm-hmm. Once I, fr- I want people to know me for me before like knowing me for what I stand for. I know that sounds weird, but I want them to make a, a judgment call on my uh, personality and first. It's real, and it's really important to do that. That's been a strategy of mine as well, and it's a long term strategy. Um, it takes time, but the point of it is not to convince them of the correctness of your views. It's not to get them to feel bad about their views or anything like that. The point of that, of that, uh, that perspective, of that strategy is to make them invest enough of their time into you that when they discover your beliefs, their mind will resist categorizing you as some crazy loony like a neo-Nazi or a Klan member or something like that because that can happen, right? So if you find if you work with people, you talk, you have a friend, you know, I, I made friend to this guy last week, and I'm gonna go tell him that I'm an anarchist. I'm yeah. gonna, you know, I'm gonna go tell him that I think <laughs> that, you know, the state as an institution is essentially an organized mafia gang and all of the all all that, that all of that entails. Um, he doesn't have anything invested in me. It's very easy for him to write me off and put me in the box of someone as if I had met someone who admitted being a skinhead. If I yeah. if I met someone who admitted me like, yeah, dude, I'm a neo Nazi and I think that blacks and Jews and gypsies and homos are the cause of the world's problems, and I think here is the re- blah blah blah. It would be very easy for me to just my mind to not even give them a fair hearing to just detach them into crazy land yeah. and to just propel them into crazy land so by by being friends with them and getting them to know you on a personal level on a friendship level making jokes cracking jokes getting them to identify with you what i like what i think is good or right or honorable or whatever not not too deep perhaps but getting a sense that I, i'm principled maybe to some extent and then slowly the veil starts to slip right i make comments about police and cops just essentially being road pirates uh i start to make comments about the money we use it's really just printed off of a printing press it's not any different than monopoly money yeah and i make comments kind of uh, things like this i don't uh, talk about how the rothschilds funded the world war one all all this bullshit you you don't go full alex jones on them all the the chemtrails they're 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 engaging in terraforming (laughs) They're, they're they're engaging in climate control no, I don't get into yeah. all that. And you got to let it come up naturally too. And yeah, you can't bring it up right, right in the conversation Be- because the, because then they'll they'll start to have cognitive they'll start to have cognitive dissonance, right? If if they dislike if they start to dislike or hate your ideas, but they like you as a person, their brain will resist that situation from forming. Mm-hmm. So if they already like you as a person, their brain, on a purely psychological level, purely subconscious level, is willing to give you so much of the benefit of the doubt, they'll even find themselves agreeing with you in times they wouldn't otherwise have. So I've had episodes with coworkers um, at other jobs that I've left where I made good friends with people over the course of many months, and I'll make comments about how voting is bullshit. How voting doesn't change anything. How voting is just a big farce that people use to believe that they're making a difference in the world. If they really wanted to make a difference, they'd do something else with their time instead of just writing names on a scrap of paper and dumping it into a glorified trash box. And I made a comment like this once, you know, and he kind of just like laughed and joked and kind of brushed off. Like he didn't like, you know, he didn't continue the joke, right? But he, he's, oh yeah, I, I get it, I understand. Right, right. But if I had, like, presented that idea to him, like, like in a sober, like, written, like, do you agree or disagree with this? He'd probably be like, no, I disagree. That's stupid. But because it came from me, because I'm a friend of his, because it, I said it in a laughable um, and kind of joking and affable manner, 
He just wanted to agree. It would have been awkward for him to stop me and be like, no, Mateus, I fundamentally disagree, and this is going to be a rift in our friendship. <laughs> yeah. Right? So it's a trick that I use, and it's kind of a long-term strategy because it takes time to cultivate that friendship and that understanding, but I think it's very powerful because you can use your friendship with people as the crowbar yeah. at, to pry some of the hinges open on the doors of this conversation and start to enter these ideas into their mind without it seeming like an intravenous shot you know, well, all of a sudden. I mean, for me, I, I, I completely agree with your uh, stance with how you handle uh, your coworkers. You befriend them first. I do the exact same thing. And then you can go into that where, like, you, you, if something comes up in conversation, obviously you, you bring up your points. And then finally, months down the road, once you feel like you've built that friendship up where you're on a normal communication every time you're at work, then, yeah, you can kind of go into – you know, when you have a free time, like you know, throw philosophy at them and like question their belief system. Uh, but for me, my problem is like I always I always try to do that first. But out of the gate, it's always really hard to find out for me, like what to talk about. You know, mm-hmm. like I, a, I'm always uh, especially now living in manage like the where I'm lo- working at Porks have come into where I'm working at. So I'm almost like, don't blow my cover. Like they recognize me. Like I recognize them. But it's like I almost like I'll I'll go greet them. I'll go talk to them and whatnot. But it's like hey, don't 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 bring yeah don't bring don't bring that up. You know, not <laughs> yet. Like I'm I'm new here still. Like right, don't right. Yeah yeah yeah. And uh, but no, I uh, I try my hardest like to to befriend people before I jump in. But like for me, like how do I how do I explain that you know I moved here for the Free State Project for Liberty in My Lifetime. You know, I moved across the continent. I know exactly. And then, like, how do I explain to them? Like, yeah, I run a a radio show slash podcast out of my living room. All right, <laughs> you know, and that I use. And I'm I'm an anarchist. That I use a cryptocurrency. You know, like all this stuff going down. Um, like it's it's hard to. You don't have to though. That's that's like level ten involvement. Oh, I understand. That's that. like Lois Lane discovering that Clark Kent is fucking. He is Superman, right? So. Maybe to take the analogy a little bit further, there are people in Metropolis who know that there is a Superman out there, right? Uh huh. But they don't connect it with the Clark Kent, the person. They just know that there are some kind of anarchists out there, and they exist in some vague, um, a, a, you know, amorphous number or amount, and they have some plans. I don't know what they are, but they're anarchist plans or whatever. Um, I don't. I, I don't honestly. I, I mean, un, until that person gets to level ten, I don't think you share those things. You know. You know. People ask me, "Why did you move here? I'm from Florida. Oh, it must have been beautiful. Well, why would you leave Florida?" And I, I use a pretense. Say, "Oh, well, the economy is really shitty in Florida. There's no work down there. I always wanted to be near mountains. I always wanted to be where there's four seasons. The economy is great here. I wanted to get away from what everything that I knew. I already had friends living up here. That's enough of a reason yeah. for people to understand. Okay. I, I use the same reason. I say I have friends out here, and I, I kind of use my move as a, uh, you know, hit reset on my life. I spent much too much of my time where I was, and yep. I want to live my new uh, a new adventure out here." Um, I kind of go with that, those lines. Sometimes I'll venture a little bit into it, and I'll say, you know, I did research before I left, and New Hampshire's live free or die attitude really resonates with me, and I like that New Hampshire doesn't require seatbelt laws, doesn't have seatbelt laws. I like that they don't have income or sales tax. I like that firearm ownership in New Hampshire is very easy and it's, it's very lax. I like that... You know, my voice, and I'll use this, my voice can be heard, as bullshit as it is, but my voice can be heard in the political apparatus here in New Hampshire, and I tend to kind of approach that, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll maybe paint myself into a corner with that, but it's a corner of, like, some kind of rugged individualist. Some kind of like put my boots on and go hiking and maybe hunting and I'm gonna fend for myself, not bandana wearing, Molotov throwing, crypto anarchist mm-hmm. right and i don't have anything against molotovs or bandanas or, or crypto anarchy obviously but it's far easier for people to identify with someone who came to the wilds of new hampshire from beautiful pristine wealthy florida because he wanted to live free or die or something like that you know that's like oh okay oh, well, uh, interesting i never i never I, I guess i never saw new hampshire like that i was born here i lived here i didn't know that yeah so that's kind of an easy way to to explain that and as the friendship matures, you can start being like, hey, by the way, did you know that in Manchester there is like an underground police accountability movement called Cop Block? And they, and they block and they protest you know, DUI checkpoints and they film cops. 
and they do you know all types of stuff and they try to hold police accountable by f filing you know lawsuits against them and where and all these things and people are like oh wow that's cool whatever police are really easy because police because almost everyone has a gripe with police so that's a real easy way to shoehorn some ideas into them without coming off like a crazy person oh yeah i uh a story from again from my day job. I I, I feel like I'm being targeted by Manch PD because I've been pulled. <laughs> I I've been pulled over by Manch PD this in the last year. I think five times, if not more. Mm. Like it's it's like every month. It's been twice in the last two weeks, and this time it's because I don't have my proper inspection sticker up front. So like I I, I literally made it to work like on the dot because I got pulled over uh, by Manch PD for like the second time. I'm, I'm bitching about it at work. Like, yeah, Manch PD just pulled me over again. I feel like I'm, they're targeting me. I'm always getting pulled over in the right, state, right. you know? And they're like, well, ha well, what happened? And I'm like, well, you know, I, I honestly think they have uh, license plate scanners on their cars, on the, their cruisers, because like literally I'm driving and like I'm, I'm coming out, uh, I'm going down the street and they're like in front of me. I see them at the intersection. So whenever I see a cop at the intersection, I'm assuming they're scanning my plates as I drive by because as soon as they pull out, they put their lights on. Yeah. All right. So I'm assuming they're they're scanning my plate, and you know, there's no way that there's in New Hampshire you have to get an inspection of your car so that you can quote unquote drive it on their roads. It really sucks. It's one of the one of the little things here that suck. There's a lot of great things about living here. Don't get me wrong. The inspection system sucks. But there's a little orange sticker that goes on your windshield, and it's, it's kind of a small. It's blue now, but yeah, is it blue now? Yeah, damn, that's how they got. That's how they can figure it out. Never mind. I thought they're all orange. If they change it to blue, they change it every year. Damn it. Yeah. That's okay. That's probably why they can see it now. That makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know they changed the inspection sticker. Yeah, as far as I know, license plate scanners are illegal in the state. Yeah, I believe and they are. only this and state. only in New Hampshire they're illegal here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe that's how they're 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 seeing it easier. They're seeing that it's orange instead of blue. Blue and orange are opposite colors. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well that makes more sense. Anyways, at work, uh, one guy was telling me one of my coworkers just like, yeah, you know, I'll I'll send you a. This uh, file that I use, I just make my own. I just put it on the <laughs> car. I'm like, <laughs> that's like, well, that's badass. I'm like, yeah, man, I'll make my own. I'm like, don't don't get an inspection. Just just slap a new sticker on it. Right, they right. won't know. They won't know the difference. I mean, of course, unless you get caught. But I mean, as long as you don't get caught, you'll be fine. Like it'll show that you, you know, have an inspector. He said he went five years without an inspection. And, like another coworker, she was talking about how like, yeah, I can't stand manch cops. They beat up my friend or something like that. Like back like five years ago or something like you know there's like all this anti-cop mentality all because i said i got pulled over yep. at my job it's something that everyone can identify with because yeah. everyone knows the feeling of fear when you see the lights in your rear view there are very few people that i've met that that when, when you know i ask them when we talk about it and i ask when they see it, the red and blue lights in their rear view they go, oh, thank God I'm protected. Yeah. Oh, thank God they're going to serve me. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. Oh, I, th I, I didn't know what kind of bandits and thuggery was out there, but now at least for the rest of the drive, I'm going to be protected and served. I've never heard that. I've only, I've only heard variations of what I feel, which is a very deep and instinctive dis level of pure fear. Yeah. That there's people behind you that have license to do everything anything they want to you and it depends on how you act with them you know what i find surprising about now mind you i've been pulled over in this state i've, I've had way too much dealings with police just being pulled over i'm over 10 like if you count the <laughs> entire state it's like it's literally once a month if not more so i've had like multiple books i want to make a montage of i record them every time i almost want to make a montage video of all the times i've been pulled over this year I probably won't do it, but set to Benny Hill music. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, the last time, uh, I, I've been trying different, um, different tactics. Sometimes I barely talk and I just have the window, you know, down. If they're really an asshole, <laughs> I'll be an asshole straight to them. Other times I'll put, I bring in just a little bit more, and I really want to say anything, but I'll be kind of polite, just because I'm I'm seeing what works just to get out of it. Uh, and this one time, uh, the last two times I've been left. Of course, they they let me go with a warning. Saying, well, well, you need to get your sticker inspected, blah, blah, you know, you get your car inspected. Right. Uh, they're just getting, they're, they're trying to, they're, they're helping me out by stopping me from getting to work and telling me I need to get my car inspected. 
you know, that's that's their community service to me. You know, right? They're serving the hell out of me that's by what detaining you pay them me. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyways, when he gave me after he gave me the warning, I was like, hey, is it cool if I can, can I ask you a couple questions? You know, just I, I I'm, I'm really curious. And he's like, that's okay. I'll I'll, I'll answer a couple of questions. So he was being very nice. I brought up Eric Garner, like you know, Eric Garner's. He was you know choked to death on camera for attacks because of he was selling a cigarette. I'm like, how is this any different where, like, you're stopping me from getting to work over a sticker on my car, you know? And are, are you really going to use violence against me if I refuse to get my car inspected and I don't change this sticker on my car? Are you going to, you know, or my or my registration if I don't have a sticker, a proper sticker on my registration? Right. You know, are you going to, did you sign up to use violence against other people for sticker violations, you know? Um, and, uh, he was like, oh, we do this cause we're trying to keep the road safe. Other people aren't going to be responsible. We need to make sure they're responsible. Like give me the government line. I'm like, you're, you're doing this. Yeah. It's for safety, but you know, people are going to drive safe cars because it's, they don't want to die in a car accident. Yeah. You well, know, he's also just evading the question. He, you know, the question you asked, are you willing to use violence to pursue these ends? And what he said was, these ends are really important. Yeah. Oh, of course, I never actually answered a question. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. But I had like a, a couple of minute conversation with a cop trying to persuade him. But oh, always, this has happened like a few times now. They always say what you guys don't understand. They, 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 they know I'm a free state or, or in the liberty community or whatnot. Because, I mean, it's the bumper stickers. They can tell and me. your license like, plates is Bitcoin. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know if they really know what Bitcoin is. Do you think is. they're smart enough to have connected those dots yet? Oh, maybe. I'm not going to give them that kind That's of a cre- tough credibility. I won't give them that credibility. I think the cop block bumper sticker probably. Probably. That's probably, probably more. That probably more does it than the. Probably uh, your giant fuck cops bumper sticker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's the one that probably does it. Yeah. Cop block is, is the most, I think, recognition among cops and locals in Manchester. Yeah. Even more so than the Free State Project. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, no, like I, I, I use that for that just to kind of like reach to his mind like my little activism with that the other person though i've tried other stuff where i just don't talk and they, they let me go on my way i'm like okay oh I'm pure yeah. uh doing doing the billy rock there <sighs> well i mean i said like yes and no like a couple uh, i didn't pull a full i didn't go full billy rock so you actually like invoke the magic words yeah and she by the way she needs i know she's gone all that but she needs to get that video up i've seen that video <laughs> i'm sure it's up. still somewhere out i there. know i know but uh, no, I don't. I saw that one when it came out too. Yeah, it, 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 I, I saw it. I thought it was removed. It was a great video. It was I, absolutely amazing. I saw that in real time. I know you were in the car. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, really? he was a film. What, you were filming I, it. Yeah, right? I filmed it. Wow. It was intense. It was intense. It was an yeah. intense video. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One of my one of my um, kind of funniest moments during that is like they get the doors open and we get out of the car. And I get out on the passenger side, and there's a cop on the sidewalk. And immediately he's like, oh, can I see your ID? Can I see your license? Blah, blah, blah. And I say, is that legally required? Or, so, or something like that. I was kind of drunk. But I said, you know, is that legally required? He says, yeah, it's the law. So can you show me? I said, oh, okay. Which law? And he looks at alcohol, is that yours? Who's is that? Blah, blah, blah. And just completely <laughs> drops the whole, like, prior, like, request. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just just pre- just just pushing back just even a little bit um, can sometimes get them to just like drop it and ignore and try something else. You know? Oh yeah, they uh, w- one time when I was pulled over back in the spring, uh, I had uh, my girlfriend at the time in the car and they wanted to see her ID. And I told them, no, you're not going to see her ID. There's no reason for that. Mm-hmm. Like I'm driving. No one else in this car is driving. Like you don't need to see ID of someone else who just as a passenger. And he still gave me off with a warning, you know. I was like stern to him too. <laughs> Man, I'll, I'll I'll say this, Manch PD. As much as I can't stand him, because I've been pushed by Manch PD. I think one, in one cop block instance, I was like, like pushed by uh, Manch PD, <laughs> and it was on film. I was recording at the time, and uh, but that being said, they have never written me a ticket. Wow. Yeah, Man. I've been I, I've been I've been t- I've only gotten one ticket, and that was by a statey. Though I have gotten a couple of parking tickets in downtown Elm, which sucks, but I've not gotten a, uh, a an actual driving ticket by any of Manch PD. Would you go like full keen and take it to court if that happened? I'm going to take next time I get a uh, parking ticket. I want to take it to court. Yeah, um, I didn't last time because I need to pay for my registration. You can't pay for registration if you have any tickets on hand. So I actually because. 
you pick and choose your battles of what you're going to fight. I'll fight a parking ticket, but, like, registration's a whole other thing. Yeah, it's a whole different beast. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I don't think I need a, a document. I don't need to pay for a permission slip to drive on the road. Right. But, but at that point, they hold that so high yeah. that I really don't want my car stolen. And you're, you're challenging the premise that they don't own the roads. Yeah. Essentially, that they don't own the roads. They don't have any, they don't have, they're not in any place to set conditions upon who can use them. Exactly. I mean, you, you pick and choose your battles. I don't have the money to do a legal defense where I, I need to drive and whatnot. I need, I need to drive. Right, right. Yeah. You know, and it's you pick and choose your battles. I definitely disagree with paying for a registration. I, I think anyone that, you know, is a right uh, uh, a, a right to travel a, uh, activist, more power to you. But that's a dangerous road. No pun intended. I think the to go guy down. from Sovereign Tactics, <laughs> I don't know if he still does that, but like he, d- he didn't register his car or anything. Hmm. He had a bunch of. Uh, stuff with about that on his Facebook Sovereign Tactics. Well, I mean, for me, like one thing I plan to do uh, at one point once I have a nicer car, because I can get away with having a crappier car right now. Uh, if I ever get a nicer car, I'm definitely not going to register it in New Hampshire. I'll register it in another state. Yeah, either Wisconsin or Montana. Yeah, you always know if it's a free state or if they have Wisconsin plates or Montana plates. <laughs> yeah, you can always tell. Like you, you go down Elm. I'm like, all right, that's a free stater. <laughs> That's a free stater, you know. Like if I see those plates, like I know they are. I saw a, um, I saw a car outside of the A Market today that had the Ron Paul Revolution sticker on it. I thought that was nice. Yeah, and one one thing I have to say I like about us in uh, in New Hampshire is we, uh, you know, we definitely um, make it known who we are. You know. Yeah, uh, not, not like, scared to hide it, I guess. Uh, exactly. Like, I love driving down the street, and you run into, you, you see another car with bumper stickers, and then most likely you know who that is or whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's like you, you hog, you're like, hey, hey, because you can recognize the plates, you know. Right, right. I've actually approached, when I worked up in uh, Guilford uh, in, a, in a parking lot where I went to go buy something, and there's someone that had a Free Talk Live bumper sticker. Cool. So they, they were getting out of their car. I didn't have no idea who this person was. Didn't know who they were, but I walked up to him and introduced myself. Like, yeah, hey, I'm a free stater. I'm, I'm I live down in Man, da da da. And, and he's at, he was actually a local who discovered uh, Free Talk Live for like five years ago somehow, and like has started going to Pork Fest and stuff like that. And it's like kind of involved in the Lakes region, porcupines and stuff. Cool, cool. Yeah, but it, like, so it's one of those things where if I see one of those stickers and I actually get a chance to introduce myself, I would do it. I'll go up to him like, you know, hey, how's it going? You know, you should have a, you know, if they're not a even if they're not a porcupine, if they're not a free state or whatnot, they're still a liberty oriented person. You see those you see a Ron Paul thing, you have common ground to like to talk to each other about. Right, right. Oh yeah. man, I had a moment like that. I was at work and um I'm I'm at the bar, I'm just making coffee, and this customer comes in and he's a regular. I've seen him and talked to him before, and he looks at me and he says, So hey, when's the next uh, checkpoint? One of the cop lockers <laughs> coming out. And like we'd never talked about this before and I was blown away. And apparently he saw me on coplock.org in in I think it was Derek J's video. Yeah, I'm wearing this swag right now. Yeah. Um Yeah, it was it was mind blowing. And I felt like all these barriers were dropped at that point. Just because wow. we had that to talk about. I actually spent my whole lunch talking to the guy. It was it was great. And he's what? just some local who's just really enthused about the cop lock. Yeah, yeah, and he recognized you from co- recognized from a cop lock video. Yeah, yeah, dude. Everyone we wow. bump into, everyone that bumps into us on the street doing the cop lock stuff, like four out of five people are super in favor of it. Oh yeah, like I um, there was this one time uh, with Anne right here. We walked down uh, Elm, and she was carrying a sign that said checkpoint on bridge, and I was I was stand, walking behind everyone with her, like just recording people's reactions. And uh, the whole time, like, people are, like, coming up, like, high-fiving us, giving handshaking hugs, like, grateful that we're out and whatnot. Like, yep. And they know what cop lock is. Like, they actually know what that is. They know what a DUI checkpoint is. They know to avoid it. Uh, it, it's, it was inspirational to see that, like, you actually can – you can block cops by literally just walking down a street with a sign <laughs> in let, New Hampshire. Letting people know. Letting them know to avoid that area. Yep. yep yeah, yep. It, it was beautiful. Um, anyways, okay. So, uh, Mateus, where can people find you at? Um, you can find me online. It's usually where I, I live most of my days now. Um uh I guess there's a there's a Facebook page um that's Matthias von Gutenberg. You have a, your own fa- page now? It's not a it's not a page. I guess it's just me. Um I haven't I haven't really crossed that bridge yet. 
If you're interested in reading some of the stuff that I've written on Bitcoin, um, you can read that at Bitcoin Magazine, uh, Author Archives. If you're interested in reading some of the stuff that I've written about uh, the state and economics, you can find, you can unearth some of the old stuff that I've written on uh, economic thought. It was an old blog. I've written a little bit for Mises. Um, so I'm kind of scattered all along the internet there, but I do... Um, I do talk with folks on Facebook and on uh, various social media. So find me on something like that. Find me on Tumblr. Fi follow me on Instagram. You can see you can yeah, see you, all, you, all you my cook, cook a lot. Do all my cooking on there. Yeah. Um, uh, so I've got you know different ways that I like to touch the internet with different aspects of my life. So find one part of it and connect with me, and I'll be happy to chat. You need to get a website going though soon. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about that as well. Uh, actually, it was Allie Havens who kind of. Um, put that further in my mind. Um, I'd like to make a, a a website as like a landing page for my ideas and yeah. my writings and things like that. Like all, all your writings, just have them like consolidated there. You yeah. know, like re even if it's like uh, if it's a paid writing for like Bitcoin Magazine or elsewhere or whatnot, like put them there like a few weeks later. Like, yeah. Put it up on there as a like, consolidated. Area. Absolutely, that's a great idea. Though I I kind of gave her some. Uh, constructive criticism on uh, her web all her website is just says under construction uh, like that's all out there and it's been like that for like months uh, and I can't yeah and, like just get up there and post stuff you know well yeah yeah maybe for 2015 there you go all right Shire Dude where can people find you at it's all at shiredude.com and what's your other show My other, well yeah I got it's like this too as well but I'm gonna I'm actually gonna start um, putting it's like this too on shiredude.com so you'll be able to get everything from that one source um, but yeah, is Rebel Love Show on Shire Dude as well? It really should be it at should least a, be. at least a link to RebelLoveShow dot com, like on the blog, like on a blog reel or like a, a link reel, something like that. Right, that's a smart idea. I'm gonna use that. I'm a smart guy. Yeah. Okay, uh, you can find me at vrebel dot com. You can find this show, uh, obviously RebelLoveShow dot com. Like us on Facebook. Uh, go uh, subscribe to us on iTunes and Stitcher. That really helps us out a lot. And maybe send us some uh, Bitcoin or Shire Dude here some Dogecoin. And uh, also, again, we are syndicated on Elrond.fm. So go listen to them. Go subscribe to all those podcasts that uh, they syndicate over there at Elrond. And uh, we're out, guys. So peace, peace, peace. peace.